I'm going to talk about today is some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years, um, which has been trying to understand different aspects of memory from the usual kind of thing that I spent the first 10 years or so of my career doing, um, which is, you know, trying to understand how we remember a word list or trying to understand how we remember a face or a, an object or, or, or whatever. And now recently in, in the last five or 10 years, we've got much more interested in, as Charles was saying, you know, these ideas about, well, what does it feel like to actually remember those things? What is the subjective experience, that sort of, you know, affective, sometimes very visceral, very vivid kind of sense that we get when we're remembering uh, some previous experience? And, 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 and how does that work? What are the different operating parameters of that? What are the different processes that contribute to that? What are the different sort of features and functions of that? And we realized and a lot of this work I've been doing with Charles and with Corinne and with others um, uh, in, in Durham and elsewhere. Uh, and one of the things we realized very early on in that sort of the development of these sorts of ideas was that these were very difficult questions to ask scientifically. And part of the reason for that is, you know, these are these are really quite difficult, hidden, intractable, sometimes quite intangible, difficult to get hold of kinds of, of concepts about well, what does it feel like? How do you answer that kind of question scientifically? And so we realized quite early on that just sort of, you know, going back and looking through the scientific literature and trying to understand things from a from a sort of an empirical standpoint was not going to get us very far. We were going to still be hidebound by the same sorts of scientific traditions and 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 sort of orthodoxies that, you know, that have that have sort of you know guided the field for for, for decades. And if we wanted to kind of really try to understand some of these, what I think now are far more interesting uh, things about about how memory works, we had to kind of step outside of that. You know, and look at look outside the box a little bit and think sort of slightly left field about where to get the kinds of influences and the kinds of understanding that could help us to ask some of the scientific questions that could really lead to, to, to a greater understanding of these areas. And so we thought, obviously, that, you know, the way to go was be to think much more broadly in terms of disciplinary influences that we could bring to bear on some of these questions. And if, you know, we're interested in answering something about uh, you know, people's experience, inner experience, then let's go to people who spent their entire careers thinking about inner experience, which is, you know, people who might be uh, working in the literary world or, or history or, 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 you know, or, or philosophy or, or, or various other different sorts of areas, poetry and, and a number of different people coming together from a number of different um, and sort of disciplinary perspectives and disciplinary backgrounds who have been thinking about these things in different ways than the traditional scientific ways. And by having conversations with these people, which with Charles's influence and others, we've been, you know, doing now for the last, I don't know how long we've been doing this, five, five, six, seven, eight years, oh, something like that, yeah. quite a long time. Uh, we, we, we've really started to get a, a, a sort of sh really interesting understanding between these different disciplinary perspectives. We've started to gradually learn how to speak a similar sort of language to each other so that we can communicate, we can understand each other. We can have work being influenced mutually in both sort of different kinds of directions as well. This isn't just about people helping the scientists, it's about the other ways, other ways as well. The sort of, you know, this, this work, these, these threads all going in different directions. And we've started to be able to sort of think about, from my point of view, scientific questions that I just wouldn't have been able to think about before I, you know, before we started, um, you know, going along this sort of road. So very long introduction without moving on in any of the slides, but what we're going to get to at some point, hopefully, is just a few examples, a few insights of some of the things we've learned about memory and the way that we experience um, remembering that has been influenced by some of these um, other disciplines and other sort of, you know, cross-disciplinary sorts of um, influences. Right. Summer. Uh, and when I see that, it's a very powerful sort of memory cue for me, not just that I remember, you know, the score and who won, and those sorts of things that might be sort of, you know, this sort of traditional, uh, you know, um, uh, memory task type um, uh, matter. But I remember the real sort of very vivid um, experience of um, witnessing that, you know, historic occasion, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the, you know, the, the roar of the crowds, the thundering and the stands as, as, ever, as the crowd went completely mad at the end. Um, you know, the huge feeling of excitement welling up, the, you know, it was a very multidisciplinary, multi-sensory um, sort of, uh, 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 of experience. Um, now, I watched it on TV. So, you know, the sights and the sounds I definitely picked up through the, through the, from, the, from the television. But the things that were much more, for example, tactile or much more olfactory, some of those other things, I only sort of either got from the TV commentator telling me about them, or actually I imagined them myself. I fleshed out that experience and, because of its excitement and its, you know, the, the dramatic nature of it. 
um, uh, and sort of filled those in with my own um, feelings about what like might have happened, how it might have smelled, how you know the, the, the sort of tactile sensations might might have been. And that's really what I think you know that I've learned that, it's, that the subjective experience of remem remembering is all about. Is it's not necessarily just um, taking off the shelf of a of a memory and replaying it. It's a much more sort of reconstructive type of phenomenon where we might have a particular, maybe just a snapshot that we store and we may, we're able to retrieve, but we base our entire experience of remembering that event on that snapshot by fleshing them out, fleshing that out in many different ways, some of which will have been very closely aligned with the actual experience as it happened, but some of them may well not be. They might be things that we've imagined, things that we've, our expectations, our biases led us to think probably might have happened, and then we might remember that event in, in, in that sort of way. And that's sort of what's you know really interesting about the this sort of way of, way of thinking. Now, traditional models of memory are very much of the you know pick the DVD off the shelf and play it sort of variety. So this is a cartoon that sort of summarizes a number of different um, uh, you know the current sort of psychological models of how memory operates. So this idea that our senses are bombarded with information, and we have some kind of a sensory buffer that that filters some of that information at a very early stage. And if we pay attention to something in our sensory environment, auditory or, or, or visual environment, that will go through into some sort of a short term memory type um, um, system of some of some, some kind. And that might be a working memory system, might be a sort of short term store type system. And we can process that information further. We can either store it over a long term in, 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 in some kind of long term memory store, or we can maybe just use it for, for, for you know, to make some kind of a response on the basis of something we've just seen. And similarly, that working memory, that's that short term store can be the interface between long term memory, being able to retrieve a long term memory, hold it online and then use that to make some kind of a response or to use it to drive our action or, 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 or whatever. So that's the very sort of traditional, simple way in which these memory systems are thought to, to operate. So the idea is we encode something, we later retrieve it, and we can have that experience, like that particular stored um, um, piece of information and, and, and utilize it um, and again. Um, now, in terms of where in the brain we think these things are happening, or, or it has been considered that these things are happening, the hippocampus is a region that has been known for many decades now to be, or thought for many decades to be absolutely central to this. And that's because of what happened to, to this chap, patient HM, as he's known in the literature, Henry Mollison, who, as many people will know, if you uh, did any kind of um, psychology undergrad, or if you just read books or whatever, you'll know that you know HM was one of these first patients to have an experimental type of, um, of surgery to treat his intractable epilepsy. That was uh, the, the leptiform activity was centered around the, the temporal lobe in the brain. And so the, 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 the experimental surgery at the time was to basically remove that part of the brain that was generating that um, 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 activity. And the hope was that by that tissue being removed, that would cure the epilepsy. You wouldn't have the error of the brain so that, that, would, um, that would be causing those, those epileptic seizures. Uh, the treatment, this is in the 1950s we're talking about, the treatment was um, successful in that HM's epilepsy was pretty much cured. Unfortunately, there was the, the minor side effect, but he had a very profound amnesia that lasted. This is showing sort of a, you know, a, a cartoon showing the, the extent of his amnesia. So uh, a, a re very um, profound retrograde amnesia. So forgetting of things that happened before his surgery, going back a number of years, but also an almost complete absence of any uh, new learning. Uh, that's not working either, but a complete absence of new learning after the surgery. So after uh, sort of 1950s, for many decades afterwards, HM was involved in testing at, um, uh, at, uh, in, in the US uh, and, and Canada. And there was uh, many hundreds of papers that he was involved in and absolutely pretty much zero evidence that he was ever able to learn anything new um, after that point. So clear evidence of the hippocampus is obviously, you know, must be centrally involved in, in, in memory. And there's many, many cases um, that have been reported subsequently that have, that have backed that up. Now, of course, if we're interested in trying to understand the subjective experience of remembering, it's unlikely, therefore, the hippocampus is going to be, you know, very useful for us because of the very profound and almost total amnesia of subjective kinds, but also, of course, more objective aspects of memory that result from, <clears throat> from hippocampal lesions. And if we assume that those two kinds of memory, perhaps subjective types of memory and more objective kinds of memory can be distinguished from one another, then maybe there is somewhere else in the brain that is more responsible for the subjective um, aspect. And that's something we've been studying in my lab, trying to identify where in the brain may be and which parts of the brain may contribute to that more subjective type of, uh, of, of remembering. Um, 
But this typical sort of knowledge, you know, understanding about how, how memory works has had this idea that there are networks in the brain that are important for memory, ne networks that are often centered around the hippocampus. The hippocampus is often a sort of key hub of these, um, uh, of these networks. And the idea is that when you're first encoding a piece of information, which has, you know, different sort of comp components to it, different features, different sensory features and other features, the hippocampus is key for that kind of new learning, for piecing together those all those different features into a coherent memory trace, which and those features are then gradually sort of stored in other parts of the brain, bits of the brain that are responsible, for example, for processing auditory information will store the auditory parts of the memory. The more visual parts will be stored in, in the visual processing areas of the brain and, uh, and, and so on. And so these are stored in sort of more distributed networks around um, the brain. And then, as I say, you know, this, this traditional view is that you have some kind of a retrieval queue and, and, and what you do is your hippocampus then goes in and picks out those bits or those features and brings them together into a, another kind of um, retrieval trace and enables you to sort of relive that, that memory um, again. But it's, you know, really clear that it can't just be the hippocampus. There must be other parts of the brain that are responsible for this, that are working together in these networks. I mean, no, that's how the brain operates. The brain is not sort of a, you know, a jigsaw with one blob doing one, blob doing one bit, one blob doing another bit. It's working together in, in, in these very dynamic um, and sorts of, of, of operating networks and operating systems. And so what's interesting is, well, which bits of the brain do we think are really important for this more subjective aspect of memory? Never have a memory talk without mentioning proof. <laughs> and the interesting about all this, uh, trying to understand these different components, of course, is, as I said, that really, you know, it's not scientists and psychologists who've thought of these things first. It is people from other disciplines, for, 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 for you know, writers and poets and authors who, who've come up with these sorts of ideas first. So this idea of memory being something that we reconstruct at the time of retrieval, that we're piecing together different elements of it, and those elements can change at the, based on our expectations and our biases at the time of retrieval, is something Proust was writing about very early in the 20th century. And also the um, uh, A.S. Byatt, for example, wrote very um, 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 interestingly um, on this, this idea about remembering. Every time we remember something, we add something to it. We change the memory, we alter it, we bias it, it, it alters over time. And the interesting thing then is, well, you know, what does that mean for our understanding of memory as a true and reliable source of information? So if we're constantly adding something to our memories, our memories are, as 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 it says, getting you know, it's changing in terms of its relationship with reality, in terms of what really did happen, and that's an interesting yeah. thing. If we're constantly adding to our memories. If we're constantly changing our memories, how do we know that something we're remembering is is a real thing? It isn't something that we just imagined, like the you know the 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 the, the, the elements of that uh, of the, the football match that I that I thought I remembered. This is uh, uh, something that undergraduates are, are, are always fascinated by is the, the work of Bartlett in the um, 30s on, um, on this idea of reconstructive um, aspects of memory. He, he had his um, uh, Edwardian at uh, the time, um, um, uh, Cambridge undergraduates, uh, uh, told them a, 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 an American folk tale um, that was, you know, in terms of its structure and its, and its cultural references and influences, and is completely alien to these, um, you know, 1920s, 1930s Cambridge undergrads. Um, uh, and had them, you know, recall that um, story and and recall it repeatedly, and found that it did change the way that they recalled that memory over those, those repeated repetitions. So they remembered less as, over over time, as you might imagine. But not only that, but they started to, you know, re sort of cast off the details, the very specific elements of that memory, but retain the gist of what happened in that um, folk tale. But they started to also introduce other aspects, other things that they knew about from other similar sorts of stories or other things they knew about from their cultural backgrounds, for example, started to be introduced to those stories. And this is something else from Bartlett's um, book, um, um, which is a you know a more, more visual sort of ex example of, of this. And this is a repeated um, uh, reproduction of a, of a drawing. Um, and you can see this is the, the original drawing on the top left here, and then these gradual reproductions from memory of the drawing. And you can see that by the reproduction um, five on, on the bottom there, you know, the details of specific um, elements, and we know culturally specific elements have been almost completely lost, but that gist has been retained. The person who's reproducing this remembers this was a, you know, it was a head, it, was, it looks like a man's head, that's the thing that's being remembered. And by the end, it's a very different drawing than the one that um, was originally um, stored in memory, but you can see how that process of that biasing and changing has happened over those repeated reproductions.
So in memory is not something that we just take off the shelf and re re experience. It's something that we might have, you know, a, a, a snapshot or some kind of an element, a schema of a particular thing that we we experienced. And at the time of retrieval, we reproduce that and we, we, we you know, we add elements and we change it and we we mess it about in many different ways. And that's that's something that's really interesting for this idea about well, how can we tell what memories are real and what memories are things that we have just completely changed and and, and imagined over 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 repetitions. So we've talked a little bit about the hippocampus, this region in the middle part of the temporal mm -hmm. of the brain as being you know, crucial for, for, for remembering. But I'm gonna talk about two other areas that our researchers suggested are very important for the more subjective aspects of remembering in, in concert with the hippocampus. It's not the hippocampus isn't central, but it's you know these other areas that are additionally involved, if you like, at the time when we're remembering things in that sort of reliving subjective um, type of way. And this is the lateral parietal cortex, a region just uh, you know towards the back of the brain at the, at the top here, um, and a region in particular there called the angular gyrus, which is a particular brain fold in that lateral parietal region towards the back of the brain. And then I'm also going to go on uh, um, during the second part of the talk to talk about anterior prefrontal cortex. So this is a region just behind the forehead, very most frontal part of the brain, which we think is really important for this idea of trying to determine whether something you are remembering is a real memory or something you might have embellished or imagined in different ways. So the hippocampus, as we've known for a long time, is, is crucial. And it's crucial for that sort of first automatic kind of remembering that you do when you first see something that you're that is familiar, for example, something that you've experienced previously, boom, that initial sort of realization that that's something you've seen before is something the hippocampus does. And the hippocampus produces a representation that is you know, very much defined by its sort of spatial and temporal basis, for example. So this idea of, you know, that when we're remembering something, we're kind of going back in time and reliving it, if you like, is something that the hippocampus is giving us. It's giving us that spatial specificity, that specificity in time as well, such that we are typically pretty good at remembering where and when things happen. And that's a very sort of characteristically hippocampal aspect of, um, uh, of, of remembering. And it's also good in terms of, you know, it gives us this initial sort of shot uh, in terms of remembering of a previous experience, which then leads, as the, you know, the traditional models had it, to that gen general sort of spreading of activation to other parts of the brain. There's other parts that are interested in the different sensory components of a memory, for example, and interested in embellishing it in, in, in different ways. So hippocampal activity, which is sort of yellow and orange here, don't worry about the details here, but, you know, the yellow and orange comes on very early in, in the, the time course of remembering. And then these other areas in the blue here come on much later on at the time when that sort of, you know, that sort of spreading of activation is happening to posterior sensory regions, for example, in order to elaborate on that memory and to, to think about it um, in, in different ways. So the hippocampus, that's, you know, that's obviously key both to remembering things like, you know, a word list or remembering, you know, something that, 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 that you know, you're, you're asked to do in a laboratory experiment. But it's also key for that much more interesting kind of remembering the actual, you know, much more sense subjective aspect of remembering some previous experience, bringing it all to bear, dra dragging in the sensory components of that, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the, the, you know, the whole sort of, you know, visceral experience of doing it, and then mentally reliving that experience again. That seems to be something that's going to involve the hippocampus, first of all, but then that's spreading to, to these other um, more posterior regions in the brain. And one element of that, as we've discussed, is that sensory component of um, these memories. The memories that we are, the ones that are most important to us, that have that you know emotional element to them, perhaps the ones that really we matter to us as individuals, are often the more sort of multi-sensory kinds of memories. They aren't just visual, they aren't just verbal. They have that sort of you know multifarious sort of nature that they bring to bear. Um, uh, in, 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 and that, that adds a certain type of emotional content to them. It adds a certain sort of visceral vividness to those. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, an element, uh, uh, an example here from, from Eliot's writing, another one from, you know, this, of course, very famous um, um, passage from um, Virginia Woolf, you know, this idea of one's first memories often being of that type, of being visual, but also auditory for, you know, hearing and, and, and you know, being visual, be, hearing these things, seeing them, feeling them, and that sort of sense that it's that, you know, bringing together that integration of those different sensory features that adds, that provides it with its emotional and its, its, its importance and its salience um, to us. Another example of that from Antony Cleopatra. So this is, um, uh, you know, Barbas um, telling of the uh, of of of, um, of seeing of seeing um, the arrival of Cleopatra. You know, Barbas is rough, rough, um, you know, soldier, 
but when he's remembering and trying to reproduce this, you know, this memory of this one, this wonderful, beautiful, amazing, you know, um, sensory kind of experience that he's had, this very beautiful um, and evocative um, phrasing that's again very multi-sensory in its nature, the very sort of visual elements, the auditory elements, um, the other components all coming together to, you know, to produce that very for him a very emotional um, um, experience of first clapping eyes on on this beautiful person. So it's that sort of influence of understanding that one of the things that might be crucial for the subjective experience of remembering being a very powerful response might be the bringing together of multi-sensory um, components, the integration of those multi-sensory components that sort of influence these um, experiments that I'm going to talk about here. And this was trying to understand, well, how does that work? What is it about multi-sensory um, 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 types of integration that drives more powerful memories and what sort of might be the brain basis of that, the brain mechanisms that lead us to have that kind of an experience. And the region that we were focusing on was this angular gyrus region that I briefly introduced at the beginning. So this region, the lateral part of the parietal cortex towards the, the back of the brain here. So this is, this is the region just here. And this region is known from um, anatomical connectivity data to be a very sort of important anatomical hub in the brain where it has very rich sort of structural connectivity all coming together from different areas of the brain towards the angular gyrus. So different regions that are involved in processing different sensory features come together and, 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 and sort of feed into the angular gyrus, but also it has very rich connectivity with other parts of the brain known to be important for memory. So frontal regions of the brain, the hippocampus, as I've talked about, and other parts of the brain all sort of lead to this, you know, this, this, this all roads lead to the, ang the angular gyrus, um, if you like. So there's an obvious candidate region for providing this kind of multisensory integrative kind of function that might be so important for um, um, the subjective experience of remembering. So we did an experiment. This was an experiment led by Heidi Benici and, and Franco Richter in my lab um, a few years ago, where we had people remembering information, remembering experiences that were very much auditory experiences. So we created a bunch of experiences that they could be exposed to that were purely auditory with no other sensory components to them, or purely visual kind of experiences that didn't have any sound or any other um, experiences, any other sensory components associated with them. And then we had people remember those while they were in the brain scanner. And we were interested in which areas of the brain are involved when people are remembering auditory information or visual information, or when they remember experiences that combined those two. So there were some experiences where it was simply visual. So this was, for example, watching a sun rising or something, or another one that was purely auditory. So that might be uh, hearing a referee's whistle or something to continue the football analogy. Uh, and then another one might be an auditory visual kind of experience, such as watching an ambulance driving down a street with a siren blaring. So very much, you know, again, a visceral event, very much visual and auditory. And what we did first was look in areas of the brain that are known to be involved in processing different sensory modalities. So we first looked in auditory processing regions, as shown on the left here. And these are regions that are involved, you know, they connect very closely to the ears and to the auditory processing system, for example. And, you know, the, when we, we hear, hopefully when you're hearing me, hopefully I'm, I'm talking to you, it's your auditory processing system that's the first sort of port of call in processing that. Hopefully you're processing it beyond just auditory information as well, but at least you, hopefully it's, it's, it's happening, <laughs> happening there. And what we found was when people were remembering these different categories of experiences, auditory experiences, visual experiences, or audio-visual experiences, the auditory processing system showed activity that was greater for the auditory memories than for the other two. It really wasn't interested in processing visual memories or particularly auditory visual um, memories. Similarly, the visual um, processing part of the brain, so this is an area of the brain that runs along from the back of the brain, along the base of the brain, and it's called the sort of visual processing stream. Um, this is a you know, difficult to make this this out. This is sort of a view of the brain from underneath, looking upwards, um, if you like, one of one of the hemispheres, and this is the visual processing area. And the graph here is a little bit more difficult to interpret, but basically there's a significant effect. This is working significant effect where the visual um, memories are eliciting <laughs> significantly greater activity than the auditory memories or the auditory visual memories. So this is a region that's involved in print, interested when you're remembering visual events. You remember them with activation in that region, but not when you're remembering auditory events, for example. So then we were interested in so what you know those those were the hypothesis-driven areas of the of the brain. We thought auditory processing might go might might, might be involved in remembering auditory memories, etc. But we then we did a sort of searchlight analysis across the whole brain and just said, without making any kind of preconceived judgments, which areas of the brain are going to be involved in remembering 
auditory visual kinds of information, so integrating across modalities. And the region of the brain that shows that pattern of activation was the angular gyrus. So this region on the left, just towards the back of the brain, the lateral part of the brain is on the outside of the, of, the, of the cortex. And as you can hopefully make out from this graph here, this region was significantly, showed significantly greater activity during the integrated um, memory condition, the auditory visual condition, than in the single modality auditory or visual processing um, conditions. So this is a region that's not necessarily interested in, you know, sort of unimodal or, or you know, single sense types of memories, but it really becomes into interested and it, you know, it gets recruited when we're trying to integrate across modalities and have that much more multi-sensory kind of, of experience. And indeed, what we were able to do in, um, also in that, that, that study was to use um, a pattern classifier. So this is kind of like a, a sort of machine learning algorithm to explore patterns of activity in, the, uh, in that area of angular gyrus. And when we did that, the classifier was significantly better able to classify memories within the angular gyrus if those were auditory visual memories. It wasn't very good at classifying memories that of, of any other type, but also the strength of that classification. So in other words, the, 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 you know, the, the sort of specificity of the representations that it was able to pick up in angular gyrus tracked with the vividness that people reported their memories to, to be. So if, they, if you experienced, if you're in the scanner and you experienced a memory as being a very vivid memory, that went along with the patterns of activity in angular gyrus being much more specific patterns. Mm. Whereas if you're, those patterns were much more diffuse or vague or imprecise, then the participants experienced that as being a less vivid memory. So that shows us, you know, that was a really interesting finding, which shows us that we we're on the right track here. This is, you know, when we're interested in trying to isolate and, and tear apart, what is it that makes a memory feel vivid, feel like a, a vivid sort of, you know, visceral type of event? It's something to do with the patterns of activity in this region towards the back of the brain, this angular gyrus region. Another component, of course, that makes those sorts of memories feel very important and very sort of, you know, emotionally laden and, and salient, for example, is the fact that there are memories. They're memories that are not just some sort of eyewitness report of something. They're something that happened to us and we experienced it from our own point of view, through our own eyes. And when we're remembering these things, we often re-experience them in that same sort of way. We don't often experience them sort of, you know, sort of from a third party perspective, seeing it happen. We're actually experiencing it as it's coming, you know, as if it was happening in front of us again. And this uh, is, is a feature of memories that, you know, that I was sort of alerted to by reading William James, for example, and, and, and other writers, that it's not about, you know, memory about just, well, this is a thing that happened in the past. It's a thing in the past that happened to me, you know, that I directly experienced. And even if we both experienced the same thing, the, the same um, event, we will remember it in very different ways because it's, you know, the way I remember it is the way that I experienced it. And the things that I'm later bringing to bear at that reconstructive time of retrieval are going to be very different to the kinds of things you might bring to bear on a memory based on your, your background, your experience, your interests, your, your biases, et cetera, et cetera. So that self-referential nature of a memory, that sort of idea of first person perspective being key to those more important and salient sorts of memories is also a very important um, element. This is another example, um, um, you know, going back to, to, to Wordsworth and, and, you know, I'm saying how, you know, these sorts of memories are so crucial because they are seen through the poet's eyes, you know, that gives that an added sort of importance and added saliency because of that sort of, you know, the way it's being retold as if I'm doing it, this is what happened to me, I, I'm reliving this as, through my own eyes again, gives it that, 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 that significance, that, that importance. And there are some um, some um, um, examples from from cognitive science to suggest that you know it's uh, consistent with this idea of first person perspective being important. But when we're able to remember experiences in that way from our own eyes type of perspective, those memories generally are memories that we do rate as being more vivid. They are more important memories to us. They have greater sensory detail. They're more intense memories because of that type of experience that we're able to bring to bear on them. So this is something we were interested in. Um, mm -hmm. uh, again, Heidi Benici led this um, study in the lab, and this time we used a methodology called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is a way of stimulating a particular part of the brain and temporarily reducing its function just for a few seconds. And so what we did, we targeted that angular gyrus region, that region towards on the, the lateral part of the parietal lobe that we thought was important for these sort of integrating sensory different components together, and perhaps then integrating that within this first person perspective. <laughs> and we looked to see what the effect of that type of stimulation was on the way people experienced their memories. And this was a, an autobiographical memory um, type, type of task. So we were asking people to, you know, to, to tell us about experiences from their own personal pasts. 
And when we did this with the with the, with the, with the um, stimulation, not only did people re re remember fewer um, details of that memory, but as you can see plotted in this graph, they were far significantly less likely to remember things from a first person perspective. That's the red um, bar here is the, the stimulation to angular gyrus than they were uh, in any of the control conditions. So we had control conditions where they weren't stimulated. We had control conditions where we stimulated a different part of the brain, so, you know, to, to, to control for, for the effects of stimulation generally. And it really was if people were, uh, were stimulated in the angular gyrus, not only did they remember a little bit less than um, otherwise, but they were much less likely to remember that, that, that that's event from that first person perspective, from their own eyes kind of perspective. So suggesting the angular gyrus is not just about integrating things in terms of multiple senses, but it's also about integrating it within this kind of framework of a kind of, you know, you might call it an egocentric kind of framework as opposed to a sort of top down allocentric framework. It's a first person perspective type of view. And so it's that that imbues it with that element of it being my memory. It's something that I, I'm remembering through my eyes as opposed to something perhaps that I was told about, in which case it might be something that I see from a different kind of perspective, a more sort of, you know, third person kind of perspective, perhaps. So that's telling us something I think quite interesting about subjective um, um, aspects of memory. But you know, I probably don't have to tell this group here who are all interested in these sorts of things. But you know, one of the great difficulties with studying these hidden components of of, of experience is that it's largely based on you know on on subjective reports. This idea of you know, tell me how vividly you're experiencing that memory. Well, you know, we don't really know whether that's really are how they are experiencing that memory. A lot of these sort of self-report measures are what we rely on to access some of these more hidden. Um, components, but you know, I've, I've always been a little bit sort of you know dissatisfied with just relying on those um, sorts of, of of responses and self report type things. So we were really interested in trying to understand: could we come up with a more objective measure of that subjective experience that we could then you know have a bit have a bit more reliability um, um, with? So Frank Richter, Rose Cooper, uh, in my in my lab, decided to come up with this sort of a task where they were. Present, so participants were presented with a bunch of different objects on some kind of a random background. Mm -hmm. And those objects could vary in the location in which they were presented on the screen. They could also vary completely randomly in terms of their orientation. So they might be you know, sort of upright orientation or they might be some kind of completely random orientation. And they also varied randomly the color in which those items were presented. And people had to see a bunch of these scenes with objects on and try and remember them. And then later on, we gave them a, a sort of memory test and the memory test wasn't simply, have you seen this object before, yes or no. In this occasion, what they had was a kind of response dial, and they could move the response dial and move the object around. So they could change, for example, its orientation to precisely the orientation that they think they studied it in. Now, it's all a bit jerky on the PowerPoint, but in the real experiment, it was all very con sort of continuous measure. They could move it just to how precisely, just at that kind of orientation. And then again, it would ask them about the, the location. They could move the object around the screen and place it just precisely where they think that they um, studied that item um, during the study phase. And also then with color, they could move the color wheel around and just change it to just that precise shade of blue that they think they might have studied it in. And so we were interested there in, well, not just necessarily, you know, can you remember this thing, but how precisely are you able to remember it? What is the sort of the, the qualitative nature of that memory that you're having? And normally, as I say, we measure these things with a self-report thing, you know, how confident are you? How vivid is that memory? How much detail is in that memory? And give people a slider or something. Here, we're actually getting them to produce something that we're able to measure about how precise that, um, that memory is and the kind of detail that that memory is containing. And when we did that and looked in the brain scanner to see which areas of the brain are activated when people are remembering this, we first looked at the sort of traditional idea of retrieval success. So which bits, which areas of the brain differentiate whether you've remembered something or forgotten something. And that was uh, showed activity in the hippocampus. So as I've said, you know, this is the, the key region for, for that basic aspect of memory. Yes, I'm remembering it. No, I'm not remembering it. But when it came to remembering that more subjective component, the precision with which people were remembering a memory, then activity um, in the angular gyrus on the left, the same region as before, the level of activity tracked how precisely people were remembering those different components of their memory. So whether they were remembering it as being just vaguely sort of on the right of the of the screen versus whether they were remembering it precisely in the right location um, that it was actually studied in. That, 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 that precision with which they remembered it tracked with activity levels within that angular gyrus um, region. <clears throat> 
this is another component of, of remembering that, of course, is really important. I've talked about this before, which is this idea of, you know, if memory is this reconstructive type of, uh, of process, how do we know that the things we're remembering really did happen? How do we know that a memory is real and, and, and not something that, that we've imagined, for example? And, you know, Byron got there before us and, and, and wrote about this. And, and as have many others before, which is this idea about, you know, how can we be sure whether a memory is real or whether it's imagined, something we really did perceive in the in the, in the world and, and really did happen versus something we might have imagined or dreamt about or been told about by somebody else or or some come from some other kind of, of, of source. And this is something that you know has a quite a, a long history actually in, in psychology from the work of Marshall Johnson and others has led to this idea of a of a system in the brain that's responsible for a process called reality monitoring. This is uh, the idea of a, of a system that helps us to determine the source of the memories that we're experiencing. Is this something that came from the real world? Is this something that came from imagination? Did I generate it myself? Did somebody else generate it and tell me about it, et cetera, et cetera? And the idea here is that this is not something that memories kind of come with. They don't come with a tag that says, oh, yes, this was Bob that told us this, or this came from the radio or whatever. Memories generally contain features, event features, which help us to determine the likely source of a piece of information. So these features can be internal features, something about that we generated ourselves, the thoughts, the feelings we had when we experienced something. They can be more external kinds of perceptual types of features, so the details of, of where and when something happened, for example. So if we're trying to remember, did I hear something on the radio or did I watch it on TV? What we do is we go in and we go through a kind of heuristic problem solving process and we go, well, this memory, it's got a lot of auditory features in it, but not very many visual features. I think it probably came from the radio. You know, we do a sort of a problem solving kind of process. Similarly, if we're trying to work out, was this a memory, something that really happened versus something I imagined? We go through and see, well, does it have lots of external features associated with it? Or actually, are there lots of internal features, things about you know, my reactions, my feelings, my thoughts as, uh, at the time of that event? And depending on the kind of proportion of those, we make that judgment, well, actually, this is very much of a sort of an external feature heavy event. I think that's a real thing. Something that's got much more of the sort of internal features and, much, and very few external features, I think that's probably something I imagined. And again, we use those sorts of you know, judgments of the features to, to make those decisions about um, the reality of something. So we use these sorts of tasks in the laboratory, these reality monitoring tasks, to try and get at this um, process of reality monitoring. So here we have an example where this is a, 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 um, a, you know, a verbal task. So we have people with um, um, everyday, you know, very sort of common um, word pairs. So Laurel and Hardy or bacon and eggs or, or whatever. And in one condition, we have people study the word pair as a whole. So Laurel and Hardy, that's in the top here. Another time we might have people study the first word of a word pair and then a question mark. And they have to try and imagine what's the second word that goes with that first word. So they imagine um, eggs here, hopefully. And then later in a test phase, we show them one of the first words of a word pair that they studied and say, this, um, this word here, did you see or did you imagine the accompanying word? So did you see or imagine Hardy in that um, when you studied, um, 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 when you had that study episode there? And the same with Bacon. Did you see or imagine the accompanying word to, to Bacon during, during the study phase? And we ask people to make these judgments. And if they get that judgment correct, then we assume that what they're doing is they're going through that reality monitoring process correctly. They're correctly identifying eggs is something that's got quite a lot of internal features associated with it so i think i must have imagined eggs and then they'll, they'll get that right and we did get people to do this in the in the brain scanner again and what happens when people are performing this task accurately is that they show activity in this region of the brain which is very much towards the front of the brain so this is a slice through the brain this way um, now it's called an axial slice so you've got the front of the brain at the top and the bottom of the brain at the back and the two um, brain hemispheres. So this is an area towards the front of the brain, this anterior prefrontal region just behind the foreheads, just slightly on the left um, in this um, example, is an area that, you know, that, that, that shows activity for reality monitoring significantly greater than any other kind of control condition that we had in that experiment. So it's not just involved in seeing these things, it's not just involved in memory, it's specifically involved in your remembering whether you perceived or imagined um, something previously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't take my, just my word for it, here's some other studies that we've done and um, that other labs have done following up on that initial finding. Again, with different kinds of reality monitoring tasks, some visual tasks, verbal tasks, auditory tasks, different kinds of demands on people. Some, so that leads to different patterns of activity through, through different areas of the brain that are to do with visual or auditory processing or whatever, but consistent activity of this anterior prefrontal region across um, all those different studies. And there's now more than some 20 studies, I think, that have, that have um, confirmed that finding of anterior prefrontal cortex being really important when it comes to determining whether our memories are, are real or not.
And this is something, this reality monitoring, um, you know, ability is something that we do actually vary quite a lot on in just sort of, you know, the individual differences that we see are quite pronounced on this kind of a task. So this is just a, um, an analysis of 150 people who came into our lab to do one or other of our reality monitoring tasks that we were running in the lab over, um, uh, I can't remember how many years period this was for different, different experiments. Um, and you can see performance on the y-axis and just, you know, subject numbers. It doesn't, you know, the x-axis doesn't mean anything. It's just so you can see the data. But what you can hopefully see is that there's a huge amount of variability. It's all just, you know, young adults, healthy young adults. These aren't patients or anything. Um, performing, some people performing, you know, fantastically well, 90% plus um, on this kind of task. And some people performing, you know, much, much, um, much worse. So 50%, 0.5 will be chance level where they just really can't do this kind of task reliably at all. Most people around sort of 80% perhaps, but there's a great deal of variability. And that's just in the healthy population. So in this room, there will likely be quite a substantial amount of variability in people's um, ability to do this reality monitoring kind of, of judgment. And what we were interested in was understanding, well, does that mean that there's something different going on in this anterior prefrontal cortex region in all these different people who are performing so differently on this kind of task? So we were interested, we worked for a while, this is Marie Buda's work, working with a guy called Alex Bonito, who came from Australia, just to work with us for a while, and who was interested for lots of other reasons in a region of the, the brain, a sort of fold in the brain, in the, 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 the anterior part of the brain, so the frontal part of the brain, right in the middle, and this is a <laughs> fold called the paracingulate sulcus. And this is a brain fold that develops very late during um, gestation, the third, the third trimester, um, uh, at the time which, you know, the, 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 the fetus is exposed to a number of sort of um, genetic, obviously, but also environmental influences in, in the womb that can lead to quite substantial individual differences in some of these, more, they're called tertiary brain sulci. And the paracingular sulcus is one of these sulci that is um, susceptible to quite substantial variation and differences across um, people just within the healthy population. So again, we're not talking clinical populations at all. This is just, you know, healthy people. Um, and when you look at these brains with the um, with a, a structural MRI scan, you can see that in some people, like in this individual on the left, there's quite a pronounced paracingulate sulcus. So I don't know whether you can make this out, but mm. where the arrow is, there's a sort of black <clears> bit <throat> here. That's the paracingulate sulcus in that individual. Hopefully you can make that out. Whereas on the right is an example of another individual where there's complete absence of that paracingulate sulcus. So it's either much, much smaller or it's not, not there at all. It's not discernible on, on structural brain scans. These are two matched individuals, matched in terms of age, matched in terms of gender, matched in terms of IQ, matched in terms of ability on all of our cognitive tasks that we want to run on them. They score exactly the same, uh, you know, give or take, on these, sites, these sorts of tasks. So this is, you know, not somebody who doesn't have an, a, a paracingulate sulcus. doesn't mean that's going to, you know, affect their lives in any no, you know, noticeable way. It's something they're completely oblivious to. They're healthy volunteers who come along to, our, to, our, to do our brain, um, to do our various uh, kinds of experiments. So what Marie did was to go through a huge database of scans of all the people who come to Cambridge to do um, different kinds of experiments and had their brain scanned. There were many, many thousands. And she selected people whose brain scans showed they had a really, really prominent paracingulate sulcus or as a, you know, apparently a complete absence of the paracingulate sulcus. And most people are kind of halfway in between. You know, there's a lot of variability. We picked out these groups who are very much at the extreme ends of the, the spectrum. And we were thinking, well, maybe then if we look really at the very first, you know, greatest extremes, we are going to find some obvious changes in terms of cognition. But again, those groups perform completely normally on every task, cognitive mm -hmm. task we gave them, apart from when we gave them a reality monitoring task. So this um, graph here, shows four groups. So these are groups with a prominent um, paracingulate sulcus in the left hemisphere, prominent paracingulate sulcus in the right hemisphere, or prominence on one side, so one prominent paracingulate sulcus in one or other of the brain hemispheres, compared to the people who had complete absence of the paracingulate sulcus in both of the brain hemispheres. And you can see that the groups with one prominent paracingulate sulcus performs just at you know, that normal level, 80% or so, in terms of reality monitoring. The group who had absence of the paracingulate sulcus, despite being absolutely normal on every other task, showed this significant impairment in reality monitoring. But they, you know, it's not, not that they were aware of this necessarily. It wasn't, in, wasn't impacting on their lives. They weren't notably, you know, making lots of errors about uh, uh, in terms of, you know, experiencing things that weren't there or, or anything like that. But nevertheless, on these kind of very sensitive tasks, tapping into those reality monitoring processes, they did show this significant impairment. So that's really interesting. But of course, it does lead to understanding perhaps about something that might be going on in people who do 
experience these problems in real life, this difficulty with distinguishing real from imagined kinds of experiences. And then, of course, I am talking about clinical groups, people with um, different psychiatric conditions, for example, who where some of the symptoms associated with those conditions might include hallucinations. So that idea of, of, of experiencing something that isn't there. And maybe what's going on there is that these people are imagining a particular stimulus, imagining a voice or imagining a, a visual image or something. And because the reality monitoring processes are a bit awry, perhaps in those people, perhaps because of something that's going on in these frontal regions, they misinterpret, they miss, you know, miss the reality monitoring process breaks down, they misunderstand, they misinterpret that imagined stimulus as being a real thing, being something that's really out there. And they, so they therefore experience it much more as a hallucination rather than as something I'm just imagining. So this is something we've been exploring quite a bit over um, the last 10 years or so. The first way we explored, and just give a couple of examples of some of the things we've done here, was to run a reality monitoring task in the scanner. So this was in healthy volunteers first, and to identify all the regions of activity, so not just the anterior prefrontal region, but the other regions of the brain that were um, activated when healthy people were doing that kind of judgment about, you know, did the, is this a real thing or is this an imagined thing? And then we also looked in patients who had schizophrenia, for example, and we didn't just get them to do a reality monitoring task because obviously they, you know, we'd imagine they'd be uh, impaired on that. And in fact, we've got data to show that they are impaired on those reality monitoring judgments. So that would lead to different patterns of activity, but that doesn't necessarily tell you something. What we were interested in was across all different kinds of tasks, are there regions of the brain that typically show reduced involvement in people with schizophrenia? But perhaps these are regions of the brain that are in some way different or in some way perhaps you know reduced in their functional efficiency or effectiveness or whatever across multiple different kinds of tasks and different paradigms and the green sort of circles there are the regions that showed that general underactivation in people with schizophrenia and the yellow red blobs are the regions that showed activity when healthy people were performing the reality monitoring task and you can see that quite striking overlap there suggesting that it is the regions of the brain that healthy people are activating when they're making reality monitoring decisions are the regions of the brain that generally uniformly are reduced in their activity in people with schizophrenia. And that might explain why people with schizophrenia are more likely to make those sorts of reality monitoring errors than healthy people. You know, most people can imagine something but be aware that they're imagining it. Whereas if those areas of the brain are underactivated, underutilized, you might be more likely to make that kind of a misattribution and think that something you're imagining or generating internally is a real thing, is something that is out there in the real world. And just to sort of you know link this up again with this idea of the parasingular sulcus, this is some work that actually we did with Charles um, uh, a few years ago now. Jane Garrison led this work. And here we were really interested in, well, it's a tie sort of all this together to bring it all together. We should be able to see in patients with schizophrenia who hallucinate, we should be able to tie that back to something that's going on in that parasingular sulcus region of the frontal lobe. So we were able to utilize the, uh, a database from Australia of people who had, and so control participants first, who didn't um, have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, didn't um, hallucinate. A group of people who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and didn't ever have any history of hallucination. So although hallucinations are very common in schizophrenia, they're not the only symptom that can lead to a diagnosis. There's you know, disordered thinking, there's other symptoms that if you have enough of them, you can get a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So that's the middle group here. And a group of people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia who regularly had auditory or, or visual kinds of hallucinations. And we measured the parasingulate sulcus, so the region in the, the frontal lobe of the brain in these three groups. And what you can see here is that the group of people who didn't hallucinate but did have a diagnosis of schizophrenia showed no significant difference in terms of the length of the parasingulate sulcus from controls, but there was a significant reduction in the people with schizophrenia who did hallucinate. So this region is not just differentiating patients from controls, it's not just about having schizophrenia or not, it's actually whether or not you hallucinate that drives that sort of, you know, finding that reduction in um, the length of the parasingulate sulcus. So it seems like it is this finding that if you have reduction in this, um, this this brain fold for one reason or another, and we're still trying to tease apart why, that leads to a greater tendency to misattribute imagined things as being real and a greater tendency, therefore, to, to actually to hallucinate as opposed to some of the other symptoms that you see in, in schizophrenia. Last slide, then. This is um, something that tries to bring all this kind of thing together, the memory precision work, the reality monitoring work, 
And the idea here is that, well, you know, if we think that if we think that the subjective experience of remembering is such an important component because it enables us to make these important decisions about our the things that we're experiencing, about our memories, about other experiences, to determine something about them, you know, are they real? Are they imagined? Are they important? Are they salient? Are they things I should really try and remember because it's going to be important for my survival? Are they things I can easily forget? then it should be that the sorts of things that that subjective experience brings us, which is that rich, vivid, precise, detailed kind of memory that's going to be much more useful for us for making these kinds of adaptive decisions. If we have a reduction in that precision or those qualitative characteristics, we should be able to show that that's going to impact on our ability to make those sorts of decisions. So the idea is that we have precise memories, we have detailed memories, we have vivid memories, we have that subjective experience of remembering for a reason. There must be some evolutionary adaptation that, you know, that we've, we've developed that. If that is, it's probably going to be that it impacts on our ability to make those potentially you know, important kinds of, de of, of decisions about the things that we've, we've experienced. So here we combined a reality monitoring kind of task with a memory precision kind of task. So we had people in a self condition, the participant themselves moving an item to a random location in the screen. And then subsequently a test, they had to move the item to exactly where they think, precisely where they think they studied it. And not only can they remember it, but also could they remember whether it was them or the experimenter who did it. And then in the experimenter condition, um, the experimenter would move the item to um, somewhere on the screen. And then the participant was able was asked to remember, you know, where was it? But also, was it you or was it the experimenter who, who moved that item? So it's combining that memory precision component mm -hmm. with the um, real, reality monitoring component. Now, very complicated graph. The idea, this is we did this as a, as a transcranial magnetic stimulation study again. So targeting this angular gyrus region um, of the brain versus a vertex control region. And we were interested in, you know, what does that do to our ability to use that side of memory precision components of our, of our memories to make those reality monitoring decisions. And you can see in the vertex condition, this is when we're just um, activate, just stimulating a random, you know, sort of region on the top of the brain that we don't think is important for these things. The, the brain is very capable of distinguishing self memories from experimental memories across different levels of precision. But when the angular gyrus is stimulated on the right there, that's disrupted. And it disrupts the relationship between that memory precision and our ability to use that information to make a specific judgment accurately about whether something was self or, or, or experimental. So, you know, was it real or imagined, for example? So that's consistent with this notion that what we're doing when we're creating, you know, why do we go to the bother of creating these very rich and embellished sorts of representations? It seems to be that it helps us to determine something crucial about our memories. It helps us to determine whether our memories are real. It helps us to do things that enable us to, you know, to encode things for the long term that are really likely to be important, important for our survival or important for our relationships or important for our, you know, our sense of ourself and our personality and all the different things that, that, are, that, that, we, that we have a, a, a memory for um, 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 at the moment. And it seems like, you know, that precision, that qualitative characteristics of the memory is crucial to making those decisions in an accurate sort of way. So to summarize, then, talked about three main sort of regions of the brain. And of course, these are regions that I've sort of, you know, tackled as being separate um, components of, uh, of memory. But of course, they interact. They work together, as we know the brain does. This is a, 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 um, a, a, a schematic from a, a review paper that Charles and, and I and Maureen Ritchie wrote um, that came out, um, I was going to say last year, but it's not last year anymore, it's two years ago now, um, uh, uh, we, we, which we talked about all of this sort of, sort of work and, and proposed this model for how these systems work together, how they interact to create these different types of awareness of our memories. You know, the, the, sort of the, you know, the, 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 the hippocampus being involved sort of early on in reactivating event features in a, in, a, in a very sort of automatic, immediate sort of way that's typically um, sufficient for many of the kinds of cognitive tasks we might give people in the laboratory, for example, in a memory lab when we're asking them to recall word lists or we're asking them, have you seen this item before, yes or no, your hippocampal representation is likely to be sufficient for most of those sorts of tasks. But if your the task demands or your particular goals or you know your desires or the things that you're interested in doing require you to consider that memory in more detail, to reflect on it, to ruminate on it, to have that subjective experience of reliving that memory again, that's when these other regions come in. So the lateral parietal cortex, angular gyrus, and other regions which are involved in integrating those different sensory components of the memory together, involved in considering it from an egocentric first-person perspective point of view, for example. <laughs> And then that information feeds forward to these more decision-making regions of the brain and the frontal lobes, for example, which are key for using that information, evaluating the information that we've got and its properties and making judgments and decisions about those memories that, that, we're, that we're retrieving, whether they're real memories or, 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 or imagined memories, for example.
Uh, I would like to thank the people in my lab who did all the work for this, <laughs> the people who've been kind enough to fund us to, to, to do this. I hope one day they'll continue to fund us to do this. Charles and I are trying to write a grant at the moment, <laughs> um, which hopefully will take some of this work forward. Um, there's a, a new cross um, fund, cross research council funding scheme that, that we're um, about to write an application for. Um, we're going to do a lot of work on this tonight, I think, and tomorrow. So hopefully we'll get make some progress on it um, to try and take this forward to try to understand you know, what does this mean for those qualities of experience. So particularly for in understanding vividness, for example, which is such a it, uh, you know we, we sort of understand we we think we have an understanding of what vividness means, but it's such such a difficult to get at concept scientifically. And a concept that you know has a rich sort of literary and historical tradition, for example, and things like Enagea and different elements of, of vividness and the different properties that lead to a sense of vividness is something that's been well thought of in, 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 in literary and historical studies, for example, and many, many others. So that's something we're hoping to make some progress with. Um, so thank you to Charles for contributing to all that work and Corinne and others here. And thank you all for, for listening. Thank you very much.